here with us today. So welcome, uh, Professor Reed. Thank you so much. And it's great to have so many people here with us. I'll just say a couple of things. As you mentioned, yeah, I had the privilege of serving as a faculty director uh, in China in the fall of 2019. So overseeing the programs in Shanghai and Beijing. And that really let me come to an appreciation of so many things about UCEAP, the staff in China, the staff in Santa Barbara, the organization and the ability to adapt to problems. I was impressed so much by all that. Um, and I think we're also seeing just this, the, the kind of community that UCEAP creates over, over um, so many years of study abroad programs. I'm really excited for um, to, to both be connecting with uh, UCEAP alumni and also uh, some UC students who might be interested in, in UCEAP in the future, as well as um, the kinds of careers that our distinguished guests um, are, uh, represent. Um, so with that, I think we should uh, introduce uh, our guests or have them introduce themselves. Um, Samantha, will you start off? Uh, yeah, thanks, Ben. Um, my name is Samantha Koo. I graduated from UC Irvine in 2018, and I just received my master's in security studies from Georgetown um, this past May. Uh, through UCAP, I did um, the London School of Economics summer program in 2015, the University of St. Andrews exchange year in 2016 and 2017, and then I was an intern with the United Nations House Scotland um, in Edinburgh in 2018. Yes, a lot of things. Um, since UCI, I have worked for a couple of consulting firms in DC, and I'm also a Pickering Fellow of the State Department, which I'll elaborate a little bit. Um, but yeah, really happy to meet you all. I'm happy to answer any questions at the end. Fantastic. Uh, Leslie. Yes. Hi, I'm Leslie Gerson. And uh, the photo that you may have seen attached to my bio is clearly one from 1969, 70, when I graduated from UC Santa Barbara some 53 years ago or whatever. And um, I am current, I was at the uh, Bordeaux uh, uh, study abroad, 68, 69. Uh, that was a year long program. After uh, teaching for about three years, French and English, I joined the State Department. Um, as those of you who've looked at the bio know that I took the exam because I was dared to do it. And that changed my life, which I'll talk about a little bit later. But I have been with the Foreign Service and as, re as a retiree with the State Department for 42 years total. Pleased to be here. Thanks so much to both of you. Uh, and so the format is that we're going to have uh, about 30 minutes, maybe about 15 minutes for each of our guests to, uh, to, to give some remarks, and then we'll open up from, for questions after that. Uh, Samantha, will you start us off? Uh, yeah, so um, as I said, my name is Samantha, um, and I guess I first want to touch on the Pickering program because that's what brought me into the State Department. So I applied for the Pickering Fellowship the year I graduated. So it was 2018. Yeah, the fall of 2018. And I received it then. Um, I'm a 2019 Pickering Fellow, so it starts the year after. But the Pickering Fellowship and its comparable fellowship, the Wrangell, are the two um, State Department um, like flagship programs to increase the diversity of the Foreign Service. So I think one thing that people always told me was like the Foreign Service is very like male, pale, and Yale, and this is what like these four fellowships are meant to do. It's meant to bring in officers that represent the United States and make the you know service look more like you know the people we represent. And Pickering has been an invaluable experience for me. They pay for grad school, and um, yeah, I'm like nearing the end of my Pickering, I guess, time. I'm entering the Foreign Service on Monday. Actually, I'll be back in DC this Saturday, so it'll be very exciting. Um, but yeah, happy to talk about Pickering or any of the I know applications. Um, or any of the other Foreign Service Fellowships. There's PAIN, which goes for USAID, which is um, international development and all of that. Um, but I guess I wanted to focus mostly on UCEAP and how that kind of contributed to my, you know, career goals. Um, so I had always known I wanted to study abroad. Um, my friends always used to tell me that like, you know, you didn't really go to UCI because you spent like most of it, like not here <laughs> stateside at all, or even like not in like California. Um, and, you know, I guess I kind of did that on purpose. <laughs> like, you know, I really loved California, but I also really wanted the international education experience. I loved my time abroad. Um, and I think for a lot of people, like going back to the UK three times might be kind of a weird thing. Um, 
but I see that and I will slow down a little bit. But um, for me, it was three different sort of programs and um, it like provided three sort of very different experiences for me. So for LSE, it was a um, program that kind of made me step out of my shell. I think I really forced myself to like talk to people, I guess. I didn't want to be alone for six weeks in London. And like, as someone who was always really shy, like that was an experience that really kind of forced me to kind of grow into the person who I am hopefully today. Um, For St. Andrews, that was a time for me to really delve into my academic interests. I like, I enjoyed Irvine. I just didn't really think I could get like the international relations um, courses and kind of focus I could get there. So St. Andrews was like an incredible experience to kind of delve really deeply into a thing. I also wanted like a really different experience from Irvine and London. And I guess that meant choosing a fishing town in the middle of nowhere with only three streets, but I loved St. Andrews and it was an incredible experience. And going for an exchange year, at least in the UK, I was able to work after I um, left St. Andrews. So I spent my summer um, working for the university before coming back. Um, So I came back So St. Andrews was my junior year and I came back my senior year to start my thesis. And then I went back abroad to um, Edinburgh. And there I was able to do this really unique um, work study program with the University of uh, UC Edinburgh. And um, I was at the uh, United Nations House Scotland and my supervisor was super lovely. She like knew I was doing my thesis on nuclear nonproliferation. They had a focus on um, nuclear disarmament at the time. So, Um, She also asked me at the beginning, like, what do you want to do with your life? And I was like, I'm going to be a diplomat. Like, I've wanted this since I was 10 years old. Like, this is what's going to happen. And um, so when she got the opportunity to send me to the United Nations in Geneva, she was like, now that you're going, like, you don't have a choice. Like, you should go see what it's really like to be a diplomat. You should see how, like, the things work. So she sent me to Geneva for a week. And I was able to represent my office alongside um, some other civil society delegations. Um, We were part of the international campaign to abolish nuclear weapons. And it was a really awesome opportunity to kind of really see diplomacy like in front of me. I think it's quite hard to do these careers from California because we're so far from like, you know, DC and all these foreign affairs sort of things. So being able to see that was like incredible for me and I really loved it. Um, So yeah, I I guess that's my UCEAP experience like in a nutshell, I think, going abroad um, once or three times was really kind of what made me a more holistic human being and more interesting candidate for the foreign service. It also made me like, uh, it kind of fostered the qualities in me that I think that the foreign service would be more interested in. Um, You'll hear about it a lot if you don't already, but like the thing that people always told me about was the 13 dimensions, which I find the State Department's website of what they expect out of a foreign service officer and um, going abroad really kind of like reinforced these, things in me. So yeah, always um, really grateful for my like ability to go abroad and all the people I've met and all the experiences. Um, I kind of think that Leslie has a more interesting resume than me, so I'm going to let her get to it, but I'll leave with a few tips before, um, sorry, someone is mowing the lawn outside, but um, I'll leave with a few tips. So my first tip is to um, try things out. I think that it's really important to get work experience and just like see what's out there. in fact, I think it's probably more important than like academic credentials or whatever. Like for me, I interned a bunch. I, you know, I did it in Scotland. I did it in DC. I did it back home in California. Um, I just wanted to see what I could do with an IR degree and IR like career. Um, So I did it from, you know, volunteering to NGOs to private sector work, consulting, all of that. And I settled on the fact that I loved kind of public service and I wanted to do a foreign service career. Um, And the second part of this first tip is that specifically for the foreign service officer tests, I personally would suggest that people just take it and see what happens. So the first part of the exam is the foreign service officer test, FSOT. And kind of like Leslie, I took it um, because I was bored and I just didn't know how to study for it. Like people had known I wanted to be a diplomat for a long time and I got so much advice about how to study for this really strange exam. And I was just kind of overwhelmed and kind of tired. So as soon as I turned 20, I signed up for the test and I took it. I was in St. Andrews, so I went down to London and I took a test, I came back up and I, took it just to see what was going to be asked and I passed it. So you really never know with these things. I think that people shouldn't be too intimidated by um, the exams. Um, I mean, it's a hard, it's not like easy, but (laughs) I think that, you know, you should always try and just see what's up so you can like study for it better. 
my second tip is to kind of strategize, but be flexible. Um, because I had known I wanted to study abroad like many times, I um, had planned this from like my freshman year, but I wasn't planning on going to St. Andrews. I wasn't planning on doing UCDC. And those are things that came as I kind of learned more about like UCI and all the study abroad programs. So um, being able to like go with the flow is something I think that's also really important. And then my third tip, I think, is to kind of follow what you like. There's not just one path into the foreign service. In fact, I think there's a lot. Like I just spoke to a Pickering fellow who was in pre-med in her undergrad, and now she's a Pickering fellow. So um, there's a bunch of different ways. And I think the foreign service really like values sort of diverse experiences and diverse backgrounds. So I think that, you know, don't hear that like you have to study abroad a bazillion times, never be at your UC or something. Um, <laughs> There's so many ways of getting in. I think as long as you follow your passions and what you like and enjoy that, it'll be okay for you. But i um, happy to answer any questions at the end. And um, yeah, I'll pass it on to Leslie. Thanks, Thanks so much. Are, are you ready for me then? Uh, everyone is absolutely ready for you. <laughs> Thank you, Leslie. Yeah, I have um, obviously a much longer um, period of involvement with the Foreign Service, with the State Department in general and the Foreign Service in specific. Um, I want to second some of the things that Samantha has said. Um, like her, I was a very shy person. Um, I went away to Bordeaux because, well, it was one of only like two study centers at the time. So um, I thought that that might be the only opportunity I would have to do anything abroad. Uh, little did I suspect that for the next 40 some years I would be in, in fact focused on international relations and be living abroad. But EAP itself prepares you for a, I don't want to say foreign service career necessarily because it could be the UN, it could be an international organization, there's so many ways to serve abroad or to serve internationally that are not related to the US government, but that's my particular focus. Uh, obviously, if you've studied anywhere that doesn't speak English, you have the language skills, which are always in demand in the Foreign Service. Um, you also have communication skills that are very special because if you've done anything in um, liberal arts or anything in history abroad, you've had to write and pre present in ways that are very different. You've had to communicate in a different way. And when you work for the government, you definitely communicate in a different way. We do not write, we do not speak, and we do not think the same way in the government. And so adapting your communication skills for study abroad really gives you a little bit of a leg up in the future. Um, you also build relationships, hopefully, with others who don't share a common back cultural background with you when you're studying abroad. And that is, what the entire Foreign Service and most of the State Department uh, experience is built on as well. You have to learn enough about cultures to be able to decide how to communicate with people and advance your agenda with them. And the final thing I want to say that EAP gives everybody is self-confidence. And you need a lot of self-confidence and know-how in order to have an international career of any sort. Uh, so I can't speak highly enough or what the Education Abroad program gave me, even though at the time, I didn't realize it would lead me in the direction of the State Department and a Foreign Service career. I think um, most of you know the Department of State, the Foreign Service is part of the Department of State, but you can have a career in the Department of State without serving abroad. Um, but in, it, in either case, uh, Department of State itself or Foreign Service subset, they're service organizations. They're like the military in a way. It, people say, well, I wanted to join the military after 9-11, for example, in order to serve. But the word service is embedded in foreign service, and it really is a service organization. You may have your personal goals and your personal interests, but basically it's up to the, the needs of the service, of where you will be assigned and what kind of work you will do. So I think anyone interested in a foreign service or Department of State career needs to remember that. It's not for you, it's for others. It's for the people that you can serve or the issues that you might serve or your government that you might be serving. So for those people who really don't want to live abroad but want to work on international relations, the civil service, most of the Department of State is staffed by civil service people who become subject matter experts, maybe in nuclear nonproliferation like Samantha is interested in, 
It may be in economic affairs. It could be on oceans or climate change. All of those things can be done without moving yourself and your family overseas in the foreign service. Uh, although you would probably travel a lot in your work, but it wouldn't be residence abroad. And then of course the foreign service, most of that experience is actually living abroad uh, three, two, three, four years at a time, depending on where you're assigned and what the political situation is and your career trajectory. Um, the great thing about the foreign service from my point of view is it's a, not a job, it's a way of life. It is absolutely a way of life. It is one career, but where you can change constantly from one job to another. It's the ideal for most of us who don't wanna be stuck in one thing in one place for our entire lives, but are kind of hesitant to uproot our families or ourselves and actually quit a job in order to move on to another one. So most of us really, I think if you think about it, we aspire to actually have a profession that's built on change and growth. And that's the greatest thing I thought about the Foreign Service. Not only did I learn several languages, one of which I probably will never use again, but, um, but you actually learn something different everywhere. You actually, if those who took a look or were able to see the bio, you can see that you can move from something like consular work processing visas or refugees or whatever, right on to multilateral diplomacy and negotiating um, treaties. So it's in fact to progress in the foreign service, and I don't mean becoming an ambassador, but just to progress in your career, you have to be in fact a generalist, not a specialist. And, um, and that's, that's very challenging and personally fulfilling. Um, I also found that I used my man management skills right away. A lot of times you start a job and you have no management responsibilities. You're simply responsible for yourself and the task that's been assigned to you. But in the foreign service, you are managing people and issues and workflow immediately. And the skills that you have there become all important uh, to your success and to the success of the organization. Um, I also, for this reason, I also want to second something that Samantha said right at the end of her presentation. In the olden days, like when I joined the Foreign Service, a lot of people came in right out of college. Now, in fact, a premium is put on people with work experience, with advanced education, but with worldly knowledge and, uh, and experience. And so I would second her suggestion that throughout your, your studies or your advanced studies or whatever you do, that you try to gather experience. It doesn't have to be. I've seen people come in in my class. There was a blackjack dealer who came in in the in the and there was a minor league baseball player whose major worry was whether his long hair was going to be he was going to have to to uh, cut it in order to to go on his first assignment. So your experience doesn't have to be specific to diplomacy. It just has to be an experience that's taught you something about the world. Um, I think I'll stop there. Those are kind of my general comments. I have an awful lot of examples of how one can do many different things in a career and so forth, but I think I'll let those come out if they're wanted in the question and answer session. What a treat to hear this, uh, all of these comments, both from you, Leslie, and also from Samantha, I really, I'm glad that we have so many people in the audience, including alumni and also um, current UC students. And, and I really wish that all of my students at, at UC Santa Cruz could hear those things, partly because, you know, there's such a, there's such a hunger for information about international careers um, and particularly state department. And, um, and, and yet it's hard for students to, to get this kind of firsthand uh, experience. Um, to learn from the experience of people who's actually, who've actually had this kind of career. So that's incredibly um, valuable. I really also appreciate Casey's ongoing notes and commentary there. And uh, it gives a real sense of like sort of the, the collaboration inherent in the, in the foreign service um, and the communication skills that Leslie was, was talking about. Um, so uh, we'll now open it up to um, 
to questions and we'll be following the chat. If you have a question, please type it um, in the chat. Um, and maybe while we're waiting to collect a few questions, perhaps I'll, I'll ask a, a question to Samantha. I was wondering if you could, um, if you could comment also on, you, you, you talked a little bit about the various experiences that, that you had. I, I noticed, including your um, UCEAP experiences and the fellowships, and that was really valuable information. And I wonder if you could also talk about your work with, that you had you'd interned at Albright Stonebridge, you, uh, as well as APCO and Global Terrorism Database. I think these are examples of really fantastic opportunities and kinds of organizations that students at UC and really ought to know about. And yet it's sort of hard to explain to them what the world is, what the infinite number of possibilities out are out there. How can students sort of find out about these kinds of organizations and opportunities and, uh, and pursue them? Uh, yeah, that's actually kind of the exact feeling I had when I was at UCI. It's just, especially like careers that are like more East Coast focused, it's just really difficult for us to get access to understand like what exactly they do. So my first, I guess, real job, probably my uh, year long internship at APCO Worldwide um, after I graduated from Irvine, I had done the um, Global Terrorism Database as my internship through UCDC. And I came back and promised I would never go back to Washington ever again because I hated DC so much. I loved the Global Terrorism Database. It was one of my favorite internships ever. I learned a lot. It was a very morbid summer. I worked on casualties and consequences of terrorism. I was reading through news reports, counting like the death counts of terrorist attacks. It was a lot, but I hated DC as a city when I first was there as a you know sophomore in college. Like it was a really rough city for like a West Coast person. It's very like kind of like a cutthroat sort of place that we're not really used to. Um, but then of course I feel like at some level that was a little facetious because I was like, I'm gonna be a diplomat. So I'm gonna be back at some point anyways. So obviously, as soon as I graduated, I went back and um, I ended up loving DC, um, especially through Georgetown, like having a community in Washington, I think makes it a lot better. Um, I still definitely recommend UCDC to all the UC students. Um, for me, it was when I got that job at AFCO, they gave me, I think, like three weeks to move out. And if I hadn't had that experience in DC before, I think it would be a much more hectic experience to have, like, just move my entire life across you know, the U.S., um, but so APCO is a strategic communications like PR firm and um, I worked in global solutions so it still had like an IR tinge to it. Um, I did both domestic and international things. Um, so it was, for me, my experiences were very varied but they all kind of revolved around the same um, like focus, like international affairs. So APCO was like international affairs with a more like private sector, like PR sort of turn. Albright Stonebridge is what I did when I was at Georgetown. Um, it was much more of a international diplomacy business sort of thing. Um, and that was also a very interesting look into like where, where IR can take you. You don't have to end up in governments. You don't have to be a diplomat. Um, you know, I worked with a ton of foreign, uh, former diplomats and former ambassadors at Albright Stonebridge. And um, these careers are just so varied and so exciting. Um, so, you know, if public's like, service is not for you, go in the private sector and you can do this work as well. Um, I like, you know, GTD was more like an academic sort of, the Global Terrorism Database was sort of more academic. And then there's things I did abroad um, with UN House, which was more NGO and civil society based. So, you know, there's a ton of different pathways. For me, it's just kind of, I thought LinkedIn was actually a very useful tool. I just typed in foreign affairs and I searched Washington metro area and I just looked at what was available. Um, you know, I didn't know what APCO was before I applied. They asked me during the interview and I was like, literally no idea. It like came up in LinkedIn. Um, but, um, you know, I learned a lot working for them and I learned about what I liked, what I didn't like. Um, and so, yeah, I think it's really smart to explore things um, outside of a government career because it may not be for you. Um, and even if it is, it can come out, you know, you can change career paths nowadays. And so, yeah, I would just kind of explore what's out there. That's very helpful. Thank you so much. And I'm so glad that you came to like Washington, D.C. I think it's such a fantastic city. And I, I also have done some teaching at UC D.C. And I, I really encourage UC students to, to check it out. Um, so let's see. So uh, and, and Bryn, you're also monitoring the chat. Maybe you and I could take turns identifying questions. Um, do, you, do you see one that you'd like to bring up? Absolutely. Yeah. I think if we go back up to the top and as we move down, I think the first question was from Casey um, intended for Leslie. She was asking how the department is recovering from um, decapitation 
incidents during last presidency? Leslie, if you feel comfortable addressing that, that's our first question here. A, a little bit. I'm probably more comfortable than Samantha would be addressing it. So um, I just in, in complete transparency, I retired from the Foreign Service in 2007. Since then, I've been working for the Office of Inspector General. The Office of the Inspector General, we're very careful not to, um, we have to remain impartial. So as we're inspecting most of the department and its entities, I'm not in the know like I used to be when I quote unquote worked on the seventh floor. That's kind of passwords for working in the orbit of the Secretary of State. Um, and all of the other people that work in that orbit. And so we tend to know more things. Um, you're absolutely right, Casey, that the senior service was completely decapitated. And I have a lot of friends of mine who were actually fired in the previous administration right at the beginning, very, very brilliant and knowledgeable people. And I asked some of them if they were planning on coming back now in, in this administration, which might have been more welcoming to them, even though they were not political people. Um, and most of them have moved on. Um, uh, that said, what's happened is so many, uh, because there was a, a much slower intake, very far fewer classes were being invited into the Foreign Service. There's now a knowledge gap kind of in the center of, of, uh, of the whole organization. So a lot of people were promoted very quickly to fill the higher slots without the requisite experience or the traditionally requisite experience. They're probably very brilliant and doing a great job. But uh, I mean, I think they're trying to bring in as many people as they can now, but there's going to be a while before the, the entire organization is hollowed out. And I see that a lot of the organizations or the entities that we're inspecting right now in my office have an awful lot of staffing um, gaps and vacancies. So we're recovering very slowly. Thank you for that. That's, that's really um, fascinating perspective about the impact of the previous administration on the State Department, and I appreciate the question and your answer for it. Um, okay, so if Bryn and I will take turns identifying these really stimulating questions that are popping up in the in the chat, um, uh, Kristen Kelly Moskus uh, asks, um, "What is the skill set and underlying experience that the Department of State is interested in for hiring?" Um. I, uh, Samantha, uh, maybe I can start and you can build on this. Um, I used to work for the Board of Examiners. Now, this was a, a while back, but they, as Samantha hinted, they will, uh, a person can come in who is in med school or a doctor's. I mean, we have lawyers who have specialized in all sorts of things from tax law to divorce who, you know, come in in, in the Foreign Service. What they're looking for are, are people with common sense, uh, problem solving, uh, perhaps work experience, personalities, and the ability to bring others along in their wake and build teams. In fairness, it doesn't really matter what you majored in or what you worked in, as long as you can pull from those background skills that, that the department is interested in. And they are varied because as you probably know, we have four or five cones in which you can uh, take your career in that direction. Could you, just as a follow on, could you um, explain the cones? Cause that's something that I sort of understand, but um, I, I bet my students would certainly benefit from a deeper understanding of what the different there's options are. There's sort of five major fields in which one enters the foreign service. If you're a generalist, um, public affairs, which is just what it says, uh, but it, it, it's a subset of cultural affairs, but also media and, and that sort of thing where you're advocating or explaining US policy. Um, the second is consular, which is what I came in in where you're taking care of all of the social work of the embassies, uh, the visas, the passports, uh, arrested Americans, uh, people in trouble, um, deaths, uh, you know, just uh, you get to know the insides of prisons intimately and so forth. Uh, the third is political, which most people think, oh, if I want to be an ambassador, I should be a political officer. That was true in the olden days, not, not so much anymore. Uh, but that's where you're uh, analyzing the, the political situation in the country and reporting it back to the U.S. and trying to find where you have commonalities and how you could advance your goals. Economic, very much the same. It's also business, uh, encouragement of business and um, and uh, you know economic cooperation. And then finally, administrative, which is actually running 
our own embassies. Uh, I mean, they have to be run. They're like small cities. And so for people who are really interested in that sort of thing, it's not a diplomatic outreach type thing, but it's very much facilitating everything else that goes on. And That's super helpful right. to get a sense of the different pathways within the Foreign Service. Um, uh, Bryn, do you see another question to bring out? I do. Samantha, was there anything that you wanted to add to that before I address the, the next question? Um, not particularly. I kind of dropped the 13 dimensions thing I mentioned in the chat. Um, that was what I was told to reference like every single time I did anything ever. Um, and um, yeah, that should be a good kind of baseline for what you should be kind of striving for. Um, another thing is that the Pickering and Ringel Fellowships, as far as I am told, are very interested in consular and management officers. Um, you know, a lot of people think they have to be a political or economic officer, but um, you know, these cones are also super important. So if you're interested in more like people work or more like management work, um, the fellowships might be for you. Yeah. Wonderful. So the next question that I see here, um, Alina Saha mentioned, um, I think on Wikipedia, I saw that US ambassadors have lost their jobs in 2021. Is that true? Well, um, ambassadors always lose their jobs when there's a change of administration. It's, um, it's you, you submit a resignation when a new administration comes in. Um, those, uh, the political ambassadors that have been appointed because of their support, usually financial or um, in campaigns or whatever in the previous administration, often are, don't expect or are not asked to remain on. They return to their um, prior lives, um, although some are kept on uh, just at, because they're immensely successful or you know, very important to an ongoing negotiation. The um, career diplomats uh, do not leave uh, for a change of administration. So if somebody is fired, it would be, unfortunately, sometimes the Office of Inspector General discovers that maybe they aren't well suited for where they might be, then they might be pulled out, but they're not fired from the Foreign Service. They're simply pulled out of their ambassadorship. But I'm not aware of any that mass firings of people other than for those traditional reasons. Thank you very much. Um, okay, among the further questions in the chat, we have one from Marty. Um, and the question here, this is, this, is a, this is getting really inside the State Department here. I was wondering how much the personality of a Secretary of State influences the careers of individual Foreign Service officers. That sounds like a good one for uh, Leslie with her long perspective. In my experience, not very, not at a lot. That said, if, a, if you impress a secretary of state for some reason, let's say you're the control officer when they're visiting a difficult place and you make everything work flawlessly and you pick up all the pieces that fall apart during a visit or something, a secretary can actually look out for you and try to find something that would suit your talents in, in the administration. But, you know, we're a pretty large bureaucracy in Washington and the chances that you will ever even meet a Secretary of State in your beginning years are, are, are very, um, very low. Um, major exception, uh, a Secretary who's in fact passed away now, Lawrence Eagleburger, Larry Eagleburger, um, I mean, he was my ambassador in Belgrade. And he used to call me up and ask me, do I want to go to lunch with him? And then eventually he becomes the Secretary of State and we actually, you know, chat occasionally on the phone about business. So um, I have seen secretaries take an interest in somebody and find a, a spot for them that they think matches their talents. But for most people, the personality of the secretary does not necessarily enhance one's career or, or detract from it. Thank you. Bryn? Absolutely. So let's read Andrew Larson's um, commentary here. Hello, everyone. I'm a UCSB alum. Uh, 2020, I studied in Amman, Jordan, 2017 to 18, and in Seoul, South Korea, 2019 to 20. I'm currently teaching English in a Sudanese provincial town and plan to volunteer in the Peace Corps in Nepal next year. What aspects of these experiences can I focus on and market to better prepare myself for the Foreign Service? I've received a lot of criticism that teaching English in Sudan 
or through the Peace Corps wouldn't uh, be preparation for the FSO because it is teaching and not experience in foreign policy or international relations. Um, lacking internship experience on the Hill or through IR research experiences are experiences like teaching English in Sudan and through the Peace Corps still seen as valuable work. Uh, I can touch on the first part of that. Um, I was a graphic designer at UCI and I did social media and I worked at a PR firm. So, you know, theoretically you look at that and you're like, what the heck are you doing as a diplomat? But um, for me, I wanted a creative outlet outside of all the you know, international security stuff. And, you know, that has, I think, come into a lot of good use for, you know, if I were to ever do public affairs work. Um, I'm good at communicating with people, knowing what, you know, the marketing things are. So you never, like, I, I think I've heard the same thing about the teaching teaching English thing. Um, I know several fellows who are Peace Corps volunteers in Ukraine, in China, they all came back and, you know, they're doing great. Um, I don't think necessarily like a hill turnship is like the way to go. You don't have to do that. Um, I know some fellows um, with me who like, I don't think they had interned in DC like ever. Um, which is fine. And I think that as long as you can learn from your you know, time abroad, I'm sure you are, um, and kind of look at the list of the 13 things they want. I feel like looking at that is a little easier to talk about than like something amorphous. Um, you know, you're going to be a better communicator. You're going to be good at cultural adaptation. You're going to be good at judgment. Um, you know, teaching abroad and have, brings so many things to the table. I thought about teaching abroad for a second before I ended up in DC, but you know, I, I don't think you should discount that experience at all. In fact, I think it's actually a really good one and makes you a more holistic person and um, you know, someone that really kind of understands the international context. I agree completely. I mean, I think the words Sudan and teaching, um, I, I know a lot of Peace Corps volunteers who are now in the Foreign Service. Um, and so, I mean, I had never even stepped foot in Washington. Um, so I, I don't think you should worry about that. I think you should continue doing that and, and um, a lot of the experiences that you, you have had will bode you well in the Foreign Service oral exam. Thank you so much. Uh, so Karisha Durham asks, can you talk more about resources if we want to work for an NGO, how to connect with NGOs? I think this also speaks to just the sense of that when you think of the field of NGOs out there is so vast. Where do you, where does a student or a recent alum even start thinking about how to pursue opportunities in it? Um, Samantha, maybe, maybe your thoughts first. Uh, my only NGO experience was kind of through UCEAP. So, you know, like people think UCEAP is just like you study abroad for a semester, but there's so many interesting things you can do through it. So for one, if you're still at UC, um, you know, that is a good one to look at, just see if there's any like international work sort of things. For NGO work itself, I'm not too sure besides kind of like seeing what jobs are available at various NGOs. I personally still think LinkedIn is the best one because it like collates things. Um, but uh, yeah, because it's such a wide field, I find it a little hard to kind of figure out where's what. I think maybe Leslie can have a better view on that, but not. Well, um, it's hard. I mean, there are hundreds and hundreds of NGOs in Washington itself. When I was um, working in the uh, Bureau of Democracy, Human Rights and Labor, I mean, half of the staff there have now set up NGOs of their own, you know, that they're involved in. So I, I, I think NGO, and then of course there's the, the international NGOs like for refugee resettlement and things like that. I mean, I, I think if, if it were I and I was looking for that kind of work, I think I'd end up going down the list of NGOs by where they're, what they're focused on and where they're located. I don't have any hints for them, um, but I can tell you that if you're in the Foreign Service and you come across an NGO that you are very committed to and like working with, it's also if you want to move into the NGO world or the UN world, it's a, it's a bridge to that as opposed to the other way around. But I don't really have any um, real insights other than looking them up, finding out what they do and seeing whether there's a fit for you. Perfect. All right, we have a, another quick question. Um, from Luis, if you work for the State Department of Foreign Service, can you keep an existing dual citizenship with another country? Um, unless this has changed remarkably in the last year, the answer is no. Um, 
I, I believe that di uh, the diplomatic security, when they do your background check and then they make you an offer, part of it will be contingent on giving up that dual citizenship. Uh, I, I could be wrong, but I, I, I think it's come full circle since when I joined and I believe this is the latest. I will tell you from experience of others though, this does not mean that when you retire you or leave the service, you cannot get that citizenship back depending on what their uh, rules for it are. And I have several friends who upon leaving the service for whatever reason, um, have resumed becoming dual national so that they could have an apartment abroad or work abroad or whatever. But I believe that you would be required to give that up um, when you get the offer for the foreign service. Thank you. So Alina has a question here, which country has the most need for ambassadors? And maybe we could broaden that question out beyond ambassadors to foreign service officers in general. Are there, are there particular sort of area skills or, or country specializations that are especially in demand uh, these days? Uh, maybe start with uh, Leslie. Well, if you're, depending on what cone you're in, um, most everybody starts in consular with visas and passports and so forth. If that's your career path, most of the work is in five languages, Spanish, Portuguese, um, Chinese, Russian, and I'm missing a language. Um, but uh, Latin America could could take every single person who wants to be a consul at any given time as could China. I mean, uh, Arabic is also an, another good language, but for different, for different reasons. So um, those are kind of the, of course we teach the languages, but as far as sheer jobs, Asia and um, Latin America are probably the two big uh, markets for uh, large size embassies. Uh, that said, if somebody really wants to be an ambassador any place in the world, which I don't recommend that you join a foreign service just to become an ambassador somewhere. Um, Africa, some of the smaller countries in Africa, because political appointees don't usually choose those uh, places, uh, it, it may be easier to build a career in the African Bureau and sometimes the South Pacific Islands. But I never recommend that anybody join the foreign service uh, with that goal as being their primary goal. Could you elaborate on that a little bit? Well, like I start, started with, I mean, you really need to think of it as what service can I provide? And what can, how can I develop as a well-rounded generalist? How am I going to be helping my colleagues and the, and the government and the, the US, American people advance their goals? And, you know, if the goal is for you to achieve something, um, it's often going to be a little bit in conflict with mm. the broader goals that I think. No, that's really eloquent and, and persuasive. Thank you. Um, Samantha, any thoughts on, on this question? Yeah, I, I think I'll pass on <laughs> I don't know enough about the kind of need-based thing of the department yet. All right. So given that we only have about 10 minutes left, we're going to um, skip down a little bit. I'm going to ask Emily Lennon's question about education and what further education episodes typically have today when entering the service. I'm currently applying to an international relations master's program abroad, and I've noticed that many public service employees studied on the East Coast. Is there an advantage to receiving one's education in the States, particularly around DC versus abroad? Um, for Samantha, did you find that your program at Georgetown was well suited for your aspirations for the foreign service? Great question. I'm really eager to hear the answers. Uh, yeah, um, I love Georgetown with like every fiber of my being <laughs> and um, would always advocate for the School of Foreign Service at Georgetown. They always like to say that the SFS is older than the U.S. Foreign Service by a year, I think. So it's not like training ground for the U.S. Foreign Service. It's like a service to the world. Um, so I really love Georgetown if you're looking at D.C. schools. Um, that absolutely like happy to talk about Georgetown anytime. But um, I would say when I was looking at grad programs, I applied to LSE, I got in for the MSc and IR. I didn't go because they it was expensive. <laughs> um, I When I was a Pickering uh, fellow looking at grad school, I ended up choosing DC area just because I wanted to be in the area. I feel like it's important to make connections there. Um, and like, I feel like 
a lot of people, as Leslie probably will tell you, like at the State Department probably came from like a Georgetown pipeline. Honestly, when I went to Georgetown, I was kind of like shocked at like how well prepared or how much they prepare their students for careers like this. Like for me, I'm like, I just don't even know how like a, like a student from the West Coast would kind of even like be able to do this because they have so many specialized training things and all that. It was a little intimidating, to be honest. Um, but I really kind of enjoyed my degree in DC and, um, you know, international degrees are awesome as well. Um, where my friends are going to Oxford, all of that. But um, if I think personally, there are a lot of benefits for like the foreign service to be in DC, but of course, like if you want to go abroad, I don't think there's any harm in that. And, um, but yeah, I like didn't look at any like California schools when I was applying to grad school, um, because if I was going to stay in the US, I would definitely do it on the East Coast and I would definitely almost only stay in DC. Um, but that was just personal preference um, of wanting to be around the things. Also, there's just like a lot of interesting internships you can do while you're in school and things to try out, like all the think tanks are there. It's um, a lot of fun, I think. Can I just add, I think that whoever you are, you should do what makes you happy and what, it, it, there's not one path to success. And I think it's important for you not to do things or make selections based on, oh, I think this is gonna get me what I need, do it because you really want to do it, no matter where it is and what it is. Thank you so much. Okay, we have so many fantastic questions, questions that I would I would not have um, thought of, which I really appreciate so much. And so maybe we'll privilege people who haven't asked questions before. Um, there was a question um, from Steve, can you expand upon local employment in U.S. embassies and consultants? Is the application process similar as an FSO and FSS? There might be people wondering about, you know, different routes into this kind of uh, work. You're talking about if you were living abroad and you wanted to work in a U.S. embassy as a, a local hire as opposed to a foreign service officer, I presume. Um, uh, stop me if that was wrong, send me a message or something there. But um, there are Americans who are resident abroad who uh, apply to work at U.S. embassies. Um, sometimes there are jobs, okay, you're not going to be the deputy chief of mission or the political counselor, but there are jobs uh, there that are reserved or given, if, if not reserved, priority is given to American citizens resident in that country. Uh, they can be as simple as being a clerk or an office management specialist, right up to uh, being, a, uh, I have a friend, for example, who's American who lives in, um, in Paris, and he's the Africa watcher, the French Africa watcher reporter, uh, gathering all the political and economic information there in Paris, but locally hired because he's married to a French person. So um, there are jobs, uh, there didn't used to be, but there are now uh, efforts made to hire Americans locally if they're qualified. Excellent, all right, wonderful. Um, we have quite a particular question here. I'm not sure if you all will know the answer, but Don Drake has asked, I am a music specialist who's traveled extensively to Cuba legally to study there. Would that disqualify me from becoming an FSO? Okay, I'm not a diplomatic secur security mm -hmm. agent. It's another specialty, it's a specialty, but um, I wouldn't think so if you've done that legally. Uh, I can't see why that would, but I mean, don't put, don't say Leslie Gerson told me that I, you know, but, but uh, it, it, would, it would be another step in your background of a clearance process, uh, just as if somebody studied or lived in Russia for a long time or China, there might be a, a lengthier background check, but it wouldn't disqualify you if, if you've done it legally. Alrighty, excellent. Um, ben, do you think we should move on to one final question um, from Alina? I think we're running short on time here. Certainly, and maybe why don't you read it because I'm 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 scrolling through and and uh... absolutely. So this question is: Do you believe there should be international borders? Do you think it's worth the pain? Whoa. Samantha obviously doesn't want to take a stab at that one. Um, that's such a hypothetical question. Um, I mean, I'm, I kind of would like to see one world, but I don't think that will ever come, up, uh, come across. Um, uh, I don't think we'll ever have it. 
um, because of the inequities, the vast inequities in the world. Um, and until we ha have reduced inequities, I don't think it's feasible, wonderful as it might be. And I think the closest we get to having no borders is a melting pot country and countries that uh, accept people from other cultures. And I think that's frankly all we can aspire to at the, at the present time. Samantha, any thoughts on, on this? The question was, uh, should there be borders between countries? And perhaps we might also take that as a, an occasion just to reflect on the, the, <clears throat> the borders and the crossing of borders that <clears throat> careers in the State Department um, facilitate. Uh, yeah, I think I would really agree with Leslie on that one, but I also think that, I mean, this is what attracts me about a career in foreign affairs. I think being able to bridge these borders while we can um, is just like so incredibly exciting, like being um, able to travel around the world and like experience new cultures. I think that, um, I mean, that's probably what really attracts me about this, like the change and being able to adapt and, uh, you know, follow this sort of lifestyle. Thank you. Um, Larissa asks, I am in my last year of graduate school. When would you suggest I start my application? I guess that'd be an application for the State Department. Should I start now or wait until after graduation? Uh, Leslie. I would start now. Um, it's a lengthy process. Um, and as, as Samantha said, it doesn't hurt um, to try early um, because it's a, it's a, complex and confusing process. And uh, sometimes people have to start it two or three times. And hopefully that would not be your case, but I would start it as soon as possible. You can always defer admission if you're uh, admitted. Uh, yeah, I would say, I think like the length is about like 18 months. Like even if you weren't graduating like tomorrow, like you would say, like it takes forever. Like even when I took the FSRT itself, it took like months of waiting for the results and then you get another thing and then you get invited to wait again. So definitely I, as I said, am an advocate for just trying it out to see what it's like. The test is very weird. And it's, I think, you know, people tell you to read books, study something like join Yahoo groups. I don't know what that means, but um, I think that as long as, I think that, you know, being able to see that test in person, just take it. No one's going to see it on your record and be like, oh, she failed it once. Like, she's not going to get it the next time. Like, it doesn't matter. Um, like, yeah, for me, being able to see that test was really important to kind of gauging what they're going to ask and what they're looking for. Um, terrific. Um, and let's see. Uh, actually, you know, Samantha, you, you mentioned a couple of times the 13 dimensions um, of a foreign service or foreign service officer. And, and uh, that inspired me to click onto that. And so I'm reading these things. There's composure, cultural adaptability, experience and motivation, information, integration and analysis, initiative and leadership, judgment, objectivity, integrity, um, oral communication, um, and, and that's just the first eight of the 13. Um, uh, Leslie, do you have any comments on, on these? We, we've, talked, we've touched on, I think, the things that the Foreign Service is looking for, that the Foreign Service selects for, ways that you can prepare yourself and so forth. Do, do these 13 dimensions um, have, what, what, what do you have to say uh, about these different dimensions? I mean, the written, any written exam, there are people that can pass it or not pass it. Um, it's something you can study for. These uh, uh, qualities, if you will, are intangibles. And when the examiners look at, look at you in the or when you're invited to the oral uh, exam, these are absolutely the things that we are looking for. How you bring others along, how you, um, how you keep your cool in the worst possible situation, uh, the kind of judgment that you make when everything is going haywire. These are things that, that can't be taught, but they can be thought about by people. They can, uh, you can't take a course for them, but they are absolutely essential, especially if you're gonna keep your career <laughs> in the long run. Thank you so much. I think we have a perfect final question here from David Waldron, who attends many of our events, so nice to see you again. Um, he asks Leslie if she could share a particularly gratifying experience in her foreign service career. Oh, I had made a list of all sorts of things that if, depending on how the direction went, of things I could talk about. But I think if you want to talk 
about gratifying. There were two things, one came out of Haiti and one out of El Salvador. Um, well, the, the El Salvador one is really more important. Um, uh, to, to make it possible to find a missing American missionary who went missing in a firefight during the Civil War and to get permission to go into a rebel held area that the army would shoot people on site basically if you went there and find that the woman was fine. And the second thing also came out of El Salvador and that was to find a kidnapped child. Uh, when I got a call at 10 o'clock at night and by the next mid morning, we had the child two years old uh, recovered um, in an undercover operation that we mounted uh, not the government, not the police. We called on the police, but um, those are the things that are really gratifying. Not a negotiation, not a trade deal, but the things that really affect human lives. For me, that's really important. That's really powerful. Thank you so much. I guess we've reached the 1 p.m. mark. Um, this has yes. been just an absolute treat. Uh, particularly to hear from our special guests, uh, Samantha and Leslie, but, but also just to feel the presence of the UCEAP community here. Um, so I just wanna say thank you so much uh, for, for doing this. Um, Bryn, I'll, I'll turn it over to you to wrap things up. Absolutely, thank you to everyone who was able to attend today. It was really lovely to see all of the conversation and thank you Casey for helping us and by providing a lot of resources in the chat, that was wonderful. Um, for anyone who is interested in these types of talks, we were, are going to have Ambassador Mark Grossman, um, one of our alums from uh, the UK in 1972 to 73, featured on October 28th. So I'll be sending information about that in a recap email um, for this event, but we just want to thank you all so much for attending today, and we look forward to seeing you at future events with us, and thank you so much for coming. <laughs> all right. Thank you so much, Ben and Leslie and Samantha. That was wonderful. That was so much fun. That was fun. <laughs> Absolutely. I, I could have talked to some of these people for a long time. I could see some of the questions flashing or, you know, thoughts flashing on the bottom. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm so glad. And then there's so much uh, potential for, for future um, such forums. You know, I think Casey should be uh, in line. Absolutely. <laughs> There's two people from my EAP program. I can see that they're thanking me on the bottom. <laughs> oh, so, so lovely. Yeah, absolutely. Anyone who's interested in participating and helping us out with conversations in the future, um, we host a lot of different alumni events. If you're interested in participating in those in any way, I also host trivia events and um, silly fun things. So if you want to get saw, involved. I saw your trivia event and I was tempted, but I had something else that was kind of conflicting. Um, Mark is going to be great. He is one of the best um, senior mm -hmm. diplomats. I, you know, just, um, you know, we're, we're personal friends too. I'm really close to his wife who, who's mm -hmm. also does my same type of work in the foreign service. So he'll be well, great. That's wonderful. Yeah. Well, I hope you come and attend there and we can um, have that. you in the chat. That'd be great. Okay. All righty. All right. All right. Thank you, everyone. We appreciate you. it. Have a lovely day. <laughs>